We made the point last Sunday that these Old Testament stories were written for our learning. And so we're going to learn a little bit from an Old Testament story today. While you're turning to Exodus 19, let me give you a little background. Exodus, of course, records Israel's exit from Egyptian bondage, right? And so they've departed Egypt now. They are making their way down to Mount Sinai. They've arrived by the time we get to to chapter 19, and they're going to be spending some time here. God's going to give them the law that will govern them, and they're going to construct the tabernacle, and for, for a year or more, they will be camped here. But that all begins right here in chapter 19 with their arrival at Mount Sinai, and then Moses goes up. Moses goes on the mountain. He meets with God, and then he comes back down with a message for the people. So I'm going to pick up the reading in verse number 10. This is Exodus 19, verse 10. The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and let them be ready. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, The Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Can you get your minds around that for a minute? What's getting ready to happen? Moses says, you go tell the people to get ready because in three days, I am coming down on this mountain. Notice the last part of verse 11. In the sight of all these people. In three days, Israel was going to have a meeting with God. Would that be cool or what? Can you imagine having an opportunity to meet with God? We talk about that sometimes. Oh, if I could meet with God. Boy, if I could have a meeting with God, I would want to ask him and then fill in the blank, right? You got some questions. Or, or I would want to say this to him or share this with him. We think about if I could meet with God, this is what I would say to him. You know what we don't think about very often? If God was going to have a meeting with us, what might he say? You know, down through time, there were occasions where men had an opportunity to do what you and I can only imagine at this point, an opportunity to have a meeting with God. And yet I would submit to you that I think most of, those t- most of the time those meetings did not go as those people anticipated. And so this morning, I want you to think with me a little while about that. I want you to think with me about some of these times that men met God and how those meetings did not go as they might have anticipated. And as we think about that, I want you to ponder with me what he might say to us if we were to have a meeting with him. Let's begin right here in Exodus 19. Let's talk about Israel's meeting with God. You'll notice that this was not going to be a casual encounter, right? God tells Moses to go down and tell the people to get ready for the third day. They were to consecrate themselves. They were to clean up. There were perimeters set around this mountain where God was going to appear. People were not allowed to get too close. In fact, oddly enough, very dramatic penalties were imposed on man or beast who would draw too close to the mountain. And so, and so for three days, they get ready for the meeting with God. And then in verse 17, it says, And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. I wonder if this is what they were expecting. Verse 18 says, Now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. Do you think that's what they were anticipating? Listen, 
The perimeters were probably unnecessary. Nobody was thinking about getting close to that mountain. And then in chapter 20, he begins to speak, and he begins to give the law, at least the beginning of the law, the Ten Commandments, right? But I want you to go down to verse 18. We know the Ten Commandments. What we may not know is how the people responded to the meeting with God. Verse 18 says, All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance, right? Nobody's getting close to the perimeter at this point. And then I love verse 19. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, for we will die. You see what they're saying there? They say to Moses, look, look, we are perfectly content, content with, with you going to God and him communicating through you to us. We don't need God to meet with us. We don't need him to talk to us. We are good. We are, we are perfectly satisfied with you handling that. Listen, when they had their meeting to God with God, it could not end quickly enough, which makes you wonder why God chose this dramatic display. Why did he meet his people in this way? Verse 20 gives us an answer. Are you still there in Exodus 20? Look down to verse 20. It says, Moses said to the people, this is in response to their fear and dread of God. It says, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. And yet I read the words of Moses there, and I'm still a little confused. You notice at the beginning of the verse, he says what? Do not be afraid, right? And then he continues on in the verse, and he says, be afraid. It's almost like he can't make up his mind. What do you want, Moses? Be afraid, don't be afraid. He says both. What's he mean? Well, back up to verse 19. What are the people afraid of? They are afraid that this great demonstration of power that they are witnessing was about to be unleashed on them. And they said, we're going to die. Have you thought about why they might feel that way? Listen, these people had experiences with the power of God. These are the people that came out of Egypt, okay? They, they hadn't heard about the plagues. They had witnessed the plagues firsthand when God's power was unleashed in wrath and judgment. And they don't want any part of that here. But that's not the point of God with this demonstration. This power, this power was not a prelude to coming judgment. Instead, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, when the story is recounted there, what God wanted was for the people to see his glory, for the people to stand in awe of him, even, even to fear his great power. But to an end, in Exodus 20 and verse 20, notice Moses said, for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you. Why? Do you see it there? So that you may not sin. Again, in that parallel account of this story in Deuteronomy 5, God says in verse 29, I wish their hearts would always respect me and that they would always obey my commands so that the things so that things would go well for them and for their children forever. You know what God wanted? He wanted the people to have a healthy respect for him, so much so that they would listen when he spoke through his servant Moses and that they would do what he said so that they could have a great life and enjoy prosperity in the promised land. The lesson of Exodus 19 and 20 with God's meeting here with Israel, the lesson was a lesson about reverence. God is trying to tell the people I want you to stand in awe of me. I want you to honor and respect me. 
And I can't help but wonder, brothers and sisters, that if God were to come here to this place, to our gathering this morning, I wonder, I wonder if he would feel like that he needed to teach us the same lesson, that we would need to learn a lesson in reverence. Did we come here with that spirit today? I wonder, when we came into this place, knowing what we were going to do today, did we ponder that God's presence would be here, that God's attention would be, would be focused on this place? Do we think about that when we're sitting here? Do we think about the purpose for which we've come together, that it's not for somebody to get up here and entertain me, lead all my favorite songs? You did pretty good today. At least it's not real great with Exalted, but I am. And we always love our God, he is alive, right? Is that what this is about? My favorite songs. Hope the sermon doesn't go too long. I got up here at five after. You talked to the other guys about time today, right? Is that where our hearts were? Are we thinking about what we were supposed to, to bring God today? And I'm bringing him an offering, a sacrifice of my worship today. And did I think about how that should be done? There are ways to worship that honor him, and there, are, and there are ways that don't honor him. And remembering in that process that God doesn't just see what's going on on the outside. He peers even into the deep recesses of our heart, and he knows the motives that drove me here and what's going on with me on the inside. Did I consider the awesome possibility that when my worship is offered sincerely, that God delights in that, I give pleasure to the Creator? And yet that terrible possibility on the other, exist, uh, other side exists as well. That he might be insulted by my offering. Did we ponder the possibility that today, by what I do in this place, I could insult him? Did we come here this morning with reference and if God were to meet with us today, would he feel the need to teach us a lesson in reverence? We need to ponder that. We are growing up in a religious community today where, where it is popular for folks to associate the word casual with worship. Have you noticed that? Some churches even advertise, you need to come here because our worship is casual. I don't want to be unfair here, okay? I think I know what they mean when they say that. Sometimes they're just talking about the way you dress. Come here and you won't have to put a jacket and tie on and get all gussied up in your Sunday and best because we're just, we're just casual here. Or sometimes they're just talking about the whole approach to worship. We don't have rigid religious forms here. We're not tightly structured. We just kind of get together and do our thing. It's sort of, it's sort of casual. I understand that, that those may be the kinds of things people have in mind when they use the word casual. I'm just going to suggest this. When we approach Jehovah, the creator of the universe in worship, casual is never a word that fits. We come before the awesome God who's rescued us and brought us together and we're here to give him honor and glory in our worship. That is always a serious matter. That is a big deal. It needs to be to us. So I wonder... God were to come down and meet with all of us today, would he feel like he needed to teach us a lesson in reverence? I need to get going because I'm running out of time and I need to talk about two more meetings. Will you back up in Exodus? I want to talk about a meeting next that God had with Moses, a meeting that comes before this meeting with the nation at Mount Sinai. So backing up in the story a little bit, all the way back to the beginning of the Exodus story where Moses has had to flee Egypt because of some problems there with some Egyptians and some problems with his own people. He flees Egypt. He goes to the land of Midian. Midian, he meets a beautiful woman named Zipporah, and he marries her, and he goes to work for her father-in-law, keeping sheep. That's important because the sheep keeping factors into this meeting. If you're in Exodus chapter 3, you look down at verse 2. He's out keeping his father-in-law's sheep one day, and he sees the burning bush, right? Y'all learned about that in Bible class a long time ago, right? We teach our little kids in Bible class the story of the, of the burning bush that Moses sees. He's captivated by that sight, and he says, I need to go check this out. And so it's as he's going to check out the burning bush that Moses stumbles into 
stumbles into this meeting that God had planned for him, just a meeting between the two of him, God and Moses alone on the mountain. How cool would that be? I mean, not just to be there when God was speaking to the whole nation, but, but just me and God alone on the mountain. Would you like a meeting like that? I'll tell you what, when Moses got done with his meeting, I think his preference would have been that that meeting never take place at all. And let me show you why. I'm moving ahead. If you're still in Exodus, we're going to look down at chapter 3 and verse 7. As God begins this meeting with Moses, he says to him, this is Exodus 3 and verse 7, the Lord said, I surely, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. Number one, God says, I know what's going on with my people in Egypt. But then verse 8, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. And I think up to this point, Moses is good with this meeting with God. God is saying, look, I know what's going on with my people. I know the terrible things down there in Egypt, and I am coming to do something about that. And I think at that point in the sermon, Moses said, amen. And in the back of his mind, maybe it's about time. So far, the meeting is going just right. God's meeting with him saying, I'm going to do something about something that's been on your heart. I'm going to help my people. Verse 10 is the problem. You still open there? Therefore, God says to Moses, come now. And I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. And that's where the meeting goes wrong. Whoa, 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 whoa. Moses did not have a good history in Egypt. There was the corpse of a dead Egyptian to be dealt with. And there was the rejection of his own people that he would be their leader. No, no. Moses had no interest in going back to Egypt. He had a wife, a family, a father-in-law in Midian. That's where he wanted to stay. And so if you keep reading in this context, chapter 3 and chapter 4, he just hits God with all of these excuses, right? I am not your God. And God's having none of it. If I could sort of summarize the story, what God says is, yes, you are my God, or my guy. I will supply you with everything you need. Now get busy and go. End of story. Meeting adjourned. And I think Moses would look back and think, I wish I'd never met alone with God on this mountain. Because what God did is he said, I've got this hard thing that I want you to do. Which makes me wonder then, if you and I were to have our moment one-on-one -on -one alone with God on a mountain, might God say to me and you, I've got this hard thing that I want you to go do. Maybe he might say to you, you know that guy you work with? I'm talking about that guy that comes in every Monday with a report on all the partying he did on the weekend, that guy that's cheating on his wife, that guy that knows more cuss words than you knew existed in the English language and scatters them through how to speech regularly. Yes, yes, that guy. The guy that you never thought about putting on a list of people with whom you're going to share the gospel. That guy. Monday, I want you to go in and talk to him about me. I want him on the list. And listen, I'm just going to tell you in advance that that conversation, it isn't going to go very well. In fact, at the beginning, it's going to go very bad, and it's going to be kind of hard, and he'll have some ridicule for you. It isn't going to go good at first, but listen, this is what I need you to do. I need you to go talk to this guy. I know that fear has been a problem with you and this evangelism stuff, and you've had a hard time getting over that, and I have been very, very patient with you, but I'm done being patient. Go make disciples. That's called a commandment, and that means I want you to go and do that. Monday morning, go do what I want you to do. Ooh. Do you think he might ask us to do something hard? And I'm just wondering, brothers and sisters, if God met with you on some lonely mountain one-on-one -on -one and said, I want you to go talk to this guy about the gospel, would you do it?
Maybe it didn't happen when we were alone with him on a mountain. But we inspired Matthew to write. He said, go make disciples. He already did call us to do hard things. So if he needed to meet with me alone, would it be to remind me that I need to do what he said, even if it's hard? If we met alone with God, would he challenge me to do some hard thing? That's what he did to Moses. One more, jump ahead to the New Testament, and let's think about Saul. In Acts chapters 8 and 9, we pick up the story of Saul. We're going to be... We're going to be reading this section of Acts just about time all the kids go back to school. I just thought I might mention that since you're just getting out. Not too far ahead, we're going to be jumping into the book of Acts. Saul's going to be one of the main characters, folks. And it's here in Acts chapter 8 we first intersect his story. At the end of chapter 7, he was there. He was there when they killed Stephen. And then in chapter 8, we read about him launching into this vicious persecutor of the church. That is Saul's early life. He was a devout Jew determined to stamp, stamp out this plague of Christianity. And so he is persecuting God's people. In fact, by the time we get to chapter 9, he is hitting the road. He is heading north to Damascus. He's going to hunt down some of those heretics up there and arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. And it's during that journey while he's heading up to Damascus that God had a meeting plan for him. Right there in the middle of the road on the way to Damascus. So I'm looking at Acts 9, picking up at verse number 3. The text says, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told what you must do. What would it be like to have an opportunity to have a one-on-one with God right here on the side of the road? I tell you what Saul found out. When he had his meeting with God, he found out that he was wrong. I mean, if I had to summarize this meeting, if I were to give you the executive summary, just cut to the point, two words, you're wrong. All this that you've been doing, opposing me, persecuting the people that follow me, trying to put a stop stop to Christianity, that was wrong all wrong. You thought you were serving Jehovah. You were actually working against his purposes. And what I need you to do is I need you now to act differently. Can you kind of get yourself in the brain of Saul for a minute and think about how that must have hit him? I mean, folks, this wasn't just sort of an average Jew showing up periodically at the synagogue. Saul was as devout and devoted as they came and worked viciously against what he considered to be the plague of Christianity and what he finds out. God says, you're wrong and you need need to change directions. So Ananias comes and meets with him and sheds a little light on that. And then we see Saul's response in chapter 9 and verse 18. Are you there? It says, and immediately, I'm picking up in the middle of the story. This is when Ananias was meeting with him. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were in Damascus. Now notice verse 20, second word. And what? Immediately, do you see that? Immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the son of God. What do you think about that? Saul of Tarsus is preaching Jesus in the synagogues. Don't you know that freaked everybody out in the synagogue, right? Verse 20, all those who were hearing him continued to be amazed. I bet they were. And we're saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name? 
and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest. But Saul kept increasing in strength, confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. I'm sorry, I just think that's a funny part of the story. <laughs> Their number one guy has changed teams. And they're so disturbed by his effective work that in verse 23, they start plotting to take him out. And I would submit to you that Saul is a compelling example of what we need to do when we find out that we're wrong, when God confronts us with the error of the path that we're on. What does he do? Acts 9 says, he changed directions. How quickly. What did your Bible say? Y'all can say it. Immediately. So I wonder if God needed to have a meeting with us. And so he set this up one day out on a lonely country road, just, just me and God. Do you think he might need to say to some of us, you need a new direction? I wonder. Would he need to say to some of us, that bitter grudge that you've been holding on to, I'm tired of that. I've talked to you about that. I've tried to explain to you how, how it is an insult to my grace and mercy that I have forgiven you and you won't forgive someone else. And besides, it's hurting you. That bitterness is a poison that's destroying you on the inside and it's tearing up my people. Enough! Quit! You're wrong about that. I'm tired of you holding that bitter grudge. You need a new direction, and I'm ready for that. It's time to change paths and head off in a new way. You find that brother, you forgive him, and you guys go on. You think he'd say that? Or do you think he might say to some of us, if he were to meet us on a lonely road, I'm tired of your half-hearted effort. I'm tired of you just kind of popping in on a Sunday morning for Lord's Supper and worship and then basically unplugging from me the rest of the week. That's not what I called you to be. I called you to be disciples. I need you all in. There's a work to be done in this church family. I need you to be a piece of that. And you need the strength and encouragement that comes from being with your fellow disciples. I need you to be all in. This half-hearted thing that you've been doing, enough. I'm tired of that. It's wrong. It's not going to get you to heaven. Quit believing that. You need a new direction. I need you to be all in, devoted to me. Would he need to say that to us? Or maybe he might need to say to some people sitting in this crowd, I need you to be my child. I know that you have been following this direction in your life that, 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 that aligns with the spiritual heritage in your family. This is what your family always believed. What you've been believing and doing is what your family has done for generation and generation. And I just got to tell you, it's wrong. It's false teaching and your family got caught up in it. And what I need you to do is quit listening to men and listen to me. Open my book. Look at what I said. And by the way, that stuff about baptism... Don't listen to men about that. Look in my book because I talked about it in my book. And these folks who've told you you don't have to need, you don't have to do that. It's just an outward sign of an inward grace. That is not my will. That's wrong. It's not what I said in my book. I need you to be baptized for the remission of your sins because that's what I said. That's what, that's what symbolized my death and burial and resurrection. I want you to do that too. I need you to be my child. And follow my path. Does it require bright lights from heaven and the voice of God to get us to listen? Or can I just read his book and let him speak to me? I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, every time you open your Bible, you engage a meeting with God. Will we listen? You know why we need to listen, brothers and sisters? Because we do have a meeting with God. 
It's coming up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There is a meeting already scheduled before the throne of Jesus Christ. We will meet with God. I'm just wondering what that meeting is going to be like for you and for me. For those who are his faithful disciples, to those to those who listened even with bright lights and thunder and voices from heaven. It's going to be the best day of our lives. And for those who would not hear him, it is going to be the greatest catastrophe. We have a meeting with God coming. We need to be ready for it. And so if you're sitting there today and you're thinking to yourself, I'm not ready. Not ready for that meeting. I need, I need to change directions. Maybe, maybe I even need to do something hard. You know what? Go back to Mount Sinai. Have the kind of awesome respect and love for the great creator that you would humble yourself before him and do what he wants you to do. We want to help you with that. So if you would like to be helped figuring out how you can serve God, you make your way down to the front. Come right now while we stand, while we sing.